and it needed, especially after the start of the record, which is, is quite intense musically and everything, and it's quite, it kind of takes you down a certain mood, and then Witch's Cup just blows the bloody doors off. <laughs> just blows the bloody doors off. <laughs> Hello, we are Biffy Clyro. This is our track by track with the NME of our new album, The Myth of the Happily Ever After. I will ignore only the past can provide us a show. Dum Dum, the opening song on The Myth of the Happily Ever After, <laughs> is a bit of an outlier for a Biffy song. It, it was. I started writing this song for another project I had and it was before we knew for sure that we were going to make a Biffy record. We were kind of feeling our way in the dark during the lockdown and everything. And just this little synth idea I had, I sampled my vocal and it just became this pretty little song that, that kind of had no pointy elbows. You know, most of Biffy songs are a bit like that, especially our, our start songs in an album. And it felt like this one, especially after the last year, it should have been a bit more of a kind of soft, soft mm. hug. So we're kind of inviting people into this record rather than saying get the fuck out of here yeah yeah it, it feels to me like we've we've come into happy through your dream that's what it feels ah. like just your the, your thoughts in a dream and that we're we're just slowly sort of sinking into your world with your thoughts and it, it like you see we're usually letting people know we're there and but it's much more subtle kind of bringing you in slowly I, th I think yeah, I think that works with the lyrics of it as well because People have been really convinced of their opinions over the last 18 months mm. in a time period where the greatest experts in the world can't figure out what's going on, but yet so many of us know exactly what's <laughs> going on and we know the truth. And that's kind of where the lyrics come from, you know. And obviously the last line, this is how we fuck it from the start. It's like we have a chance to kind of start again, which we were doing this record mm -hmm. with the first song. And it's a hinge point. If we make the right decisions and we could go somewhere great. But if we just stick to the same old status quo, then we're gonna end up exactly where we were before yeah. the fucking, and we'll just be having another pandemic in about fucking eight years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Hunger in Your Haunt uh, is probably the musical idea that we've kind of had for the longest. It's a riff we've been playing probably for about 18 months, two years, mm -hmm. maybe even a little longer. Mm -hmm. Couldn't crack the song. It was like, it was a magical opening riff, but the rest of the song didn't match up. So I don't know whether it was Pandemicville, Lockdownville, but suddenly it, it wasn't an issue to complete this song. It just yeah. kind of came out. And I think this song more than anything in the album is me kind of venting my frustrations and my, my lack of control over what was happening in my life and all of our lives. And it's about trying to just still find a reason to kind of get up and go and and. You know, those mornings where you're like, why Why should I get up? What do I need to get up for? There's nothing, you know, everything was was simple to the point of absolute dullness. Yes, <laughs> misery. And, and that's what this song's like, you, you know, you've got to find your own reasons to get up and go because everyone's dealing with this at the moment. And so it's a kind of it's a frustration at the time. Musically, it probably lives in, a, in, a, in an early Biffy era mm -hmm. in terms of the musicality and the kind of decisions we make in this song. Mm -hmm. Are probably reflective of earlier. Records. I think so. I think definitely so. I think we maybe talk about some of the other songs later on, but it felt like some of the other songs allowed us to unlock this in a way where we, mm -hmm. it was almost like we had the key, we just didn't know which door to put it in, mm -hmm. and finally we found the door. Yeah, I feel like the, what we were going through in the pandemic definitely unlocked this one in terms of the, the verse anyway, because it was the verses that we were struggling to get right, yeah. and then just that delivery, that kind of nihilistic delivery that you give in the verse really unlocked it and pushed it over the edge. Yeah, it, it, it felt it almost. Doing a melody in a song like this, for, it, it, because of what it was about, it just felt that it would have sincerity wasn't what it yeah. needed. It would have been too like become something that I, that it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. It needed to be more kind of yeah. just humanistic or something. Yeah. I don't know if that's the right phrase for it, but not fanciful. Mm -hmm. That's like, the opposite of adorned or fanciful. Yeah. Believe it or not, this song started out as a folk <laughs> yeah. rock song. Like, like, 
for some reason the first version of this was pure folk it and, and it was it was so fucking boring <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't fucking believe it but the end of it was like what but there was ma- there was magic to it beauty still um, <laughs> and again I think if it wasn't for us just getting together to try and keep a bit of joy during a really hard time for everyone and get together to just make music for the sake of it I don't think this song would have changed shape mm-hmm. but again it just felt like a moment of I mean, liberation is probably the best way to yeah. put it. It's one of the shortest songs we've ever had. It's like two and a half minutes long. It was the, the even me saying to the boys, "Listen, I think I think we should do this really heavy." And I just remember the boys looking at me going, "What, what this folk song?" And like that moment of when we just turned it into this different beast, mm-hmm. it just felt so right and so like um, it didn't need to be thought out. No. You know, it was like we we were thinking, "Oh, but it's folk. It's this and that." And it's like actually, you know what? It's it's whatever we fuck we want it to be. That's what music is. That's what creation is. It's like it can be anything, and and it just it ended up just being this perfect little kind of hardcore song. Mm. In terms of the lyrics, it's about it's about gaslighting and and in a relationship and that kind of it's kind of toxic relationship where you kind of you live in kind of this fantasy reality which which you both kind of mutually agree upon but doesn't kind of get discussed and, and just how sometimes you can end up in a tricky tricky situation in that and. So it's a kind of anti-love love song, if you know what I mean. Like, you know, when you, when you need someone, but maybe you're not, you know, it's not always straightforward. Separate Missions is a real pivotal song for me when we were making the record. Do you remember when Simon brought that in? And he was like, just keep doing that for ages. Don't stop doing that. You keep doing that. You, and we just, we were like a... A quiet runaway train, not a runaway train like Denier, where it was just full. You know, the brakes mm. were fucked. It's like one of those trains where you have to, train, that's it. You, you have to keep it. <laughs> you have to keep working. But quite unlike like, like Cods to just sit on a groove, and it felt just so right. I think the first time we played that song, by the time we got to the end of the first time playing it, I was like, that is absolutely golden. Mm-hmm. Didn't really go through many changes in that song. I wouldn't say. No, because like like fresh out the box, it felt right. You we, know? D- we didn't when we were playing it in the room. We didn't. It didn't ever enter because we weren't playing live or on tour. None of the songs felt like they had to enter these kind of the rock zone and the mm-hmm. kind of big bombastic dynamic zone. And that's a good example that if we played that for another six months in the practice room, it would become more muscular and something mm-hmm. a little different. And I think that it maintains a, a, a subtlety to it, a lightness to it. And and that's because we were just trusting the feeling of it rather than the kind of the fit. Sometimes you're if you physically want to feel a song, you know. And and this was one where you just it just felt right in there. It didn't need much. It, mm-hmm. it was just, it was still the mm-hmm. song is is still absolutely. Witches Cup are. West End type song. <laughs> we were just discussing with uh, Mr. Trendle earlier. Um, it, this song definitely feels like a musical type song. Uh, it, it, there's a there's a joy and a frivolity to this piece of music that I think we don't necessarily have a lot of. Sorry, I'm now talking to I'm now talking to you when I should be. <laughs> but there's a frivolity to this song I think that that doesn't inhabit a lot of our music. You know. Um, and it needed, especially after the start of the record, which is, is quite intense musically and everything, and it's quite, it kind of takes you down a certain mood, and then Witch's Cup just blows the bloody doors off. <laughs> just blows the bloody doors off. Um, and it's, it's pure joy, this song. You know, it's, it's a song about cults primarily. That was the inspiration from it, and kind of like giving yourself over to something wholeheartedly with no questions asked, you know, which I think is... As I said earlier, like it's it's something I admire and also I'm terrified of and and pity people. But then there's there's a there's a security in that I guess, and that's where the lyric like I know we all die, but there's I just hope there's one exception, and that's kind of about your icon or your deity that you think's a special one, but everyone else's is, isn't yeah. special, you know. And I just I love that kind of entitlement. Well, I don't love it, yeah. but that kind of entitlement and arrogance that, that you kind of have and. And yeah, as I say, at, at times it must be beautifully simple, and mm-hmm. at other times it must be make you sick to the back fucking teeth. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's what the kind of yeah. So the witches' cups kind of like a, thinking of it like drinking the Kool Aid, like the Jim Jones fucking horror showdown in Guyana. Oh. And I, actually, and I do think that 
politi- political side of things is becoming cult like I think everything's becoming you know just a, it's a stark way to see how divisive everything is because it is we, people now just believe shit because it's what they should believe and because it's part of their cult and and it's like you have to be in one tribe or the other uh-huh. you know you, you, and you can't have you have to have different opinions from everybody else mm-hmm. and you've only got your own your own viewpoint on things that's it's like the, the, the fact isolating. of asking a question is not a provocative thing to do and it's I become know. provocative to ask mm-hmm. questions about mm-hmm. anything and that's that's, that's where the kind of fear is and that's what this song's about it's like giving up that giving up asking questions and mm-hmm. just kind of accepting it for what it is mm-hmm. which is probably not healthy <laughs> Holy Water uh, was a song I'd been playing the acoustic guitar kind of when we were starting to work on a celebration of endings I had a kind of version of Holy Water mm-hmm. um, it didn't feel like it had quite reached where it needed to be its destination so we didn't really include it in the album mm-hmm. it's a song about as humans kind of tr- using your last resources like thinking when is how far is too far that's kind of what the song's about I think if we'd worked on this song before pandemic and before our, everyone's lives became very, very simple and straightforward, or and conversely, very complex and complicated. <laughs> um, but you know, this song would have probably stayed as like a, a, a lovely little sincere message, and you know, like like can speak into the heart because of what this last year's taught us is like, you no, know, like things aren't even that simple. You <laughs> know, things aren't even as simple as oh, that's a bit upset, and it's like yeah. no, there's more, there's more to it than that. And and I, I, we had this other bit of music that just didn't really have a home, and so when we worked on it and recorded it, it was an unfinished thought until we added the outro, and it felt like such an integral part. It felt like that's the foundations of the song, and actually, the holy waters, the actual quiet part of the song, is the introduction. Um, musically, the outro was meant to kind of represent. And originally, it was about resources and about when we, you know, when is too much, too much in the world when we've used everything at our fingertips and we don't have any resources mm-hmm. anywhere. And the end of the music was meant to almost be, sound like Armageddon to a certain extent. But through the pandemic, it kind of meant, kind of became something different. And I think it kind of the strength of that outro is almost like a spiritual strength now rather than like running something negative I actually see it as as trying to find strength through a really dark time you know and, and musically hopefully it does that even though it's you know well it's amazing how music can mean something different to you day to day you know never mind going through such a huge moment the whole world's going through such a huge moment and suddenly that song took a real sort of shift for me mentally a little bit it almost had even it was an even stronger metaphor, I think, than it was previously. It was just such a strong image of what, how fucked up mankind is, humankind is, you know? And how greedy all, we are. All the lyrics about the hospital room, they, they were, it, was, it was all written like that, and mm-hmm. that's what kind of freaked me out a little, because we didn't put it in celebrations or any of that, like, those ideas. And and then after that, it was like, this this song needs to live now. You know, it was mm-hmm. like, this song is living now. This is, this is reflective without intending to be... Just another species to explore In the symphony of God Errors in the History of God is a song that lives and dies in the groove mm-hmm. and it's a hell of a groove. Yeah, just it's like a, I mentioned a train before but it, it feels like... A, Did you just go Damon Auburn? Did I? <laughs> Train. Get the text, text specials. <laughs> it just sort of motors along, which is quite different for us. You know, it's just not like spiky up and down. It's sort of less dynamic in a way, you know. It just sits on that groove, which is a nightmare to play, so you're never going to hear it live. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. That's not That's true. arthritis in the, in the mail for <laughs> exactly. that. So. Absolutely. Um, yeah, just uh, again, that's a song that p- potentially we might have approached in a slightly different way if it was going to be in like a, a regular time scale of a mm-hmm. record. We mm-hmm. might have kind of pulled it apart and put it back together but it was trying not to ask too many questions when we were recording these mm-hmm. songs and it was like the beauty of that song and the magic was in the rhythm and the way the drums and the bass work off each other and I found it easy to write it a song on, on top of that you know it felt quite straightforward and, and it is our most it's the most nihilistic outlook in the album I mean it's kind of been a pure misanthrope and just not seeing any positives in the human race you know and, and mm-hmm. then I do, you know again I sound like such an arsehole saying that because it's all it's, oh, right impressive much but well, it's a snapshot. But it's a snapshot, it's a snapshot of how I'm feeling in this life, and that's why there's kind of different. There is different moods to this album because mm-hmm. it was, it, you know, what it was like yourself. It's like every week we were waking up, and some weeks you thought, right, I can do it. You know, it's not that bad. And then the next week you're like, I, 
I'm not even opening the curtains today. And well, this I, I is a song sp- where I didn't want to open the curtains. I didn't even want to see my own reflection in a fucking window. Uh-huh. Never mind other people outside, you know. Well, you, you have to embrace that in life because you, you know, if you if you just keep denying the the negative things in the world, you'll never really sort of face them and deal with them. And you have to acknowledge sometimes mm. that you have those days where it's like, I don't want to do anything. I don't really I, want to be here. You know. I think we're lucky to be able to put the. You know, it saved us to be able to put all these frustrations that we had. I'm now fucking doing that. <laughs> Are you making yourself I'm, up? No, I'm doing it like fucking right. politicians oh, right. do. Okay. You know, you don't point anymore. Yeah, yeah, you just... What a loser. <laughs> um, what was I fucking saying? <laughs> just about um, embracing the, the yeah, those n- days, like, you know, yeah. acknowledging it sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate... Oh, yeah, was that... Uh, yeah. Or, or just you, you getting the chance to express that feeling. Yes, mm-hmm. that's... Yeah, sorry, I'm such a stoner. <laughs> Yeah. This is all going to make the cut. Yeah, yeah, this, this is, this is you direct. Can this, right? um, you know, as liberty, it's like it, I've realised as I've grown older that it's such an important part of me dealing with shit. Like if I don't get the chance to kind of put it into songs, and I'm sure the boys feel the same, but playing playing stuff out, you know, mm-hmm. you, you get it out, and and that's a really important part of mm-hmm. trying to be a, a normal and decent human being, that's you know, it. For, because it it points. Dark thoughts can really overtake you and affect your outlook and everything. And mm-hmm. and I think if I if I wasn't able to communicate it that way, I, I don't think I would know how else to communicate mm-hmm. it, and it would end up manifesting mm-hmm. in in negative behaviour. And and I, I feel that like anyone that can can express themselves through art, or whatever type of art it is, it's like we're all very lucky to do that, you know. And so because it is a f- outlet, otherwise it just starts fucking clogging up, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I've seen plenty of people who do it with that outlet, and it can be it can eat you away from the inside, and it's it's tough. So I definitely feel privileged to to be able to be a fucking misanthrope mm-hmm. in a song rather yeah. than be a misanthrope in my fucking life, exactly. you know. Haru Rara, kind of a bit of a lounge lizard song. This it's really kind of sleazy. Again, another song that if we if we played it live or anything, it wouldn't have this kind of. No. With the change, the seediness from. almost. Um, the, the title Haru Arara, it's the name of a, what well, means glorious spring, but it's the name of a, of a really famous racehorse in Japan that lost all 131 of its races. But through its career, the people of Japan or they're into horse racing start to convince themselves that it would win a race because how could it possibly run its entire career and, and, and not win or not, not, not come dead last? Mm-hmm. Of course, it did keep keep kept coming dead last, but people people would infiltrate this town and start to invest money in the town, and the, the horse racing stadiums was saved because people were coming to see this horse win. Of course, it didn't win; it always lost. But what a beautiful kind of sentiment and, and, and moment to t- like story to take something from in this time period where it feels like it's all just bad news after bad news. And actually, I just think it's wonderful that from such defeat, from pure defeat. It actually saved a part of you know a part of its community, and it just and it brought joy to people, and I think that's wonderful. I just and I love the same. underdog as well. Yeah, we, do, we quite like that. We do we like, that. like that. <laughs> under horse, Jim. Under horse. Oh, hey. it's an under horse. We're on our way together. Unknown Male, really important song emotionally in the record. You know, it's um, been fortunate enough to, to lose a couple of people, a couple of friends, close friends throughout the years that um, are on to bigger and better things. Um, so I like to th- think of it. But when people, when you're facing that darkness, where the, where the fuck do you go? Like, there's not always a way out. I think if you suffer from depression and, and you know, and dark, dark thoughts, you can feel all right one day, but you have you have to kind of be aware. That, that, you know, I describe the devil never leaves, and it's like it, it's always going to come back. And I think that's what I've realised as I've grown older and, and and still suffer from dark thoughts and things. Is that actually you kind of keep it you keep it at bay for a bit, and then it, but it always comes back. And and my sentiment in this song is is a, but trying to be a companion to someone who's in that space, and 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 it can be so hard to to verbalise these things and. And I do think that there's, there's a, sometimes when you verbalise something too much as well, you can dig yourself into this hole where you're wondering, why do I feel like this? When, why do I feel this about feeling like that? You know, and and it's just, I just wish I could wrap my arms around people that feel like that. You know, I'm, I'm empathising because I because I absolutely feel I felt like that mis, myself at times, um, but I just wish I could throw my arms around the people I care about who didn't find a way through. And this song's my way of musically trying to kind of make sense of of 
the unthinkable and the, and the nonsensical. Um, but there's a lot of love in this song, a lot of love in this song. I particularly like the line, there's some of you and me, because I, I, I think about that with all relationships, you pick up a little bit of people that you that you love, you take strength and support from some people. Sometimes you take a bit of negativity from some people and you try and repel that from your life, but that's what sort of being alive is, is sharing thoughts and emotions and kind of helping each other through it. And that, that's always the line for me that kind of means the most to some of you. I me, mean, I think that really is a really strong metaphor, you know. We all get along sometimes Doesn't mean we shouldn't try, try, try I think it's time to realise Existed Really subtle. Really, subtle song, really subtle. Important part of the record as well. Like a whisper. Um, it, it was the key song in terms of us just knowing that we were going to make a record. Mm -hmm. It was it was a song I'd been playing at the piano a little bit, played it to the boys one day, and whatever I didn't say this to the boys at the time, but whatever the reaction was going to be, would have kind of made up my mind whether it was a good enough song or whether it was going to lead to anything. And, mm -hmm. and I was expecting the boys to go, oh yeah, that's nice, you know, yeah, keep, keep work, <laughs> keep trying, Sai, keep. Try. But they were like, oh, this is great, I can't wait to record this. It and that was right. yeah, and and getting that little bit of confidence as well when you're working in new music is just what you need because it then gives you permission to go into the next steps. Mm -hmm. And and it was a song that we didn't want it to become like a ballad or like a soft rock song. We wanted to. There's only like one organic instrument on it, mm -hmm. the yep. acoustic guitar. The rest is like loops and keyboard, mm -hmm. and it's just—it was just a lovely song to make, using primarily our ears in that song, not worrying about about it being in the room, just worrying mm -hmm. about whether it made you feel right when you're listening to it. You know, we basically deliberately made decisions we wouldn't have normally made in a record. Mm -hmm. You know, there's points when when if people listen to the song after, they'll know probably where it could have gone and down a, a different biffy mm -hmm. path, and mm -hmm. it, it felt like the subtlety of it and that kind of. Um, and this, you, what was the word you used? You, subtle, I think, is what I said. All right, yeah, great word. <laughs> <laughs> it was the subtle subtleties. <laughs> of it, but, but it, it just—it gave the whole album permission to exist. It was also the first song where, because again, I'm worried writing about writing music during lockdown. It was like I don't want to just write a bunch of songs that are just about pure frustration and just dwelling in this in this kind of mm -hmm. tough time. And that was the first song lyrically where I managed to kind of sing about about the toughness of that time period but through a different lens and it's about forgiveness it's about allowing people to make mistakes it's about you know don't you don't need to pick a fucking side all the time you can you can you can you know you can figure things out for yourself but but no one comes out fully formed it's mm -hmm. like we all have to make fucking mistakes to, and that's what existing and being is you know we should all be at our best just before we die, mm -hmm. which is a bit grim, but mm -hmm. but that's yeah, that's kind of the truth of it. Unless you turn into a right wing arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> which seems to happen to an awful lot of people when they hit a certain age. Uh, but you know, like that's what experience experience brings oh, you. That yeah. it brings wisdom, and yes, yeah, so I just think we can be more forgiving, forgiving with people. Whether they, you know, there's different levels of mistakes people can make. Some people deserve to be written off, and not, but not everyone does. And it's just about having seen things through other people's eyes as well. Ben, just get your breath back from this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've only just got my breath back from recording the drums for this song. Um, it's This one's definitely relentless, I would say. Um, hypnotic as well. It, it puts you into a hypnotic state because it's so repetitive. And it's very tiring to play. <laughs> very tiring. Um, but yeah, I guess it's a, it's a song of two, three halves. I don't know how many halves. You can't, can't have three halves. Three halves. It's meant to get to the point where your head's about to explode and then it just opens up into this lovely pasture in the middle. Um, and then, of course, finishes with a bit of the same, a bit more of the relentlessness. Yeah, it's like it's definitely a sibling to <laughs> pop syrup. Like yes. arrangement wise, it's very similar. It starts and ends with like intensity, and in the middle, it kind of has this different, different kind of feeling and different emotion. As Ben says, the middle of Slurpee, that the, the the floor gives way, and you're mm -hmm. kind of floating. It's yeah. something that we haven't done a lot of. Again, if we were working this in the room, it potentially would have had a different dynamics. But as Ben said, see the repetitive nature of that rhythm. It becomes this meditation. Mm -hmm. That I, and, and I love that about heavy music. A lot of people that listen to heavy music, he just hear it as noise. Or if you don't like heavy music, you just hear it as noise. Mm -hmm. There's something so soothing and meditative about heavy music that when you tune in, it just give you know, it just, it's kind of overwhelming and it, it's whelming. <laughs> Are you whelmed? You're not over or underwhelmed, you're just whelmed. Um, and it just felt like it, it, important to have also something that musically is a bit, 
like a bit more fun to end this record as well. We you know we wanted it to be like, uh, oh my god, like wipe your brow at the end of the record. You know the key lyric in this song is you know before the rhythm stops. Uh, what's the fucking word? Lyric stops <laughs> before I can't remember. Lyrics are really good in this song, <laughs> it, but you know it. It's just, again, about in this last year, if there's one thing we've fucking discovered, it's the things that we should value and the things that we should cherish. And that actually a lot of stuff is just noise, even though I've talked about the beauty of noise, like a lot of other stuff is just extraneous noise that we can put into the background. And all I kind of want to feel coming out of this is just feel that I love the people I love more than I did. And the things that are important are all the things I have closest to me. And I don't have anything that's 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 unnecessary or extraneous yeah. kind of kicking around and I think a lot of people have streamlined their lives that way and emotionally I think the way to do it is just look for love you know look for loving in your life now something like a total fucking hippie no, I mean it's going from well. errors in the history of the god to, yeah, to pure to. <laughs> but it was a year for that it was a year for that well so you have to look for love through the darkness when, when the times get as dark as they have been there's only one way out of it and, and I think it was the not being able to express love last year. That's mm -hmm. what was so weird. Like the people you loved the most, you couldn't get to. And it was yeah. like, so like it, it was even considering love in a way that you, like, thinking about love as a non-expressive emotion. It's mm -hmm. like, that's quite hard. We all associate love with intimacy or, you know, or some some communication and actually, how, but love does exist even without communication. I think that's mm -hmm. a beautiful thing. I think if anything, it can grow, you know. Let's wow. hope so, let's hope so. We'll find out in the next album. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we'll be in February 2022. <laughs> Keep your eyes peeled. <laughs>